Welcome, Lindsay. Hi, how are you? Good. You're all set. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you, Athena. Let me know when you're ready, Lindsay. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I have a meeting at one right before this, so <laughs> I try and get out, but I am ready. Okay, I didn't want to start when you weren't. <laughs> Welcome, Ben. Hello. Hi there. Hi, Shalini. Let me get this going. It was nice staying up late with everyone last night. <laughs> Thank you for, I'm for enduring, with, Ben. Yeah, uh, I'm imp impressed you guys are able to stay, <laughs> stay uh, sane through all that and still kind of process all the important decisions you're making. Yep. So I think we have everyone here. We're waiting on Rob and Dave. Who you tend to pop Rob's in. We, you, we've got about five, 10 minutes till we'll get to zoning um because we're gonna do minutes first but if you want to check on that christine that would be fine okay i am um, i i don't I, I need to leave around three um just so you know and uh if i'm still sharing my screen or anything i might maybe i'll just email it to someone yeah that that'll work we okay. i'm hoping to be done the zoning portion by then so okay. that should work well so let's get started um, so it is 2.02 in the afternoon and I am calling this November 17, 2020 meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order. Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL chapter 30A, section 20, allows us to hold this virtual meeting. The meeting is being recorded for future broadcast and any votes we take will be by roll call. At this time, I'll call on each committee member by name to confirm that you can hear me and we can hear you. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Shalini Balmilne. Present. Mandy Johanneke is present. Evan Ross. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. And Sarah Swartz. Present. Thank you. Um, and we will we have some guests that we'll introduce as we get to those items i switched our or agenda order around a little bit today um to try some stuff out and we'll see how it goes we're going to start with minutes there are three sets of minutes on the agenda we only have two of them october 13 and october 27 um, I put in the packet the original minutes I received and also revisions. The revisions are very basic. I am going to share my revisions for the October 13th minutes um, so people can see them. It was correcting the name of the committee. Um, and then that might have been the only thing on it. Hold on. That I think was the only thing on the October 13th minutes that I had for revisions. Um, are, did anyone else have any revisions for the October 13 minutes? I am seeing none. I'm going to stop the share of that one and share the October 27 minutes. Because again, I was correcting the name of the committee. Um, and then I'm not sure what the formatting was. I added here, just a fixing of a Scrivener, the word at, and then I added to the end of the paragraph on section A that Schreiber mentioned the practice in other cities of posting a sign at the location subject to an application for a use permit, as we were talking about Article 14. I corrected a Scrivener error, error down here, the word in should be is. Um, and then the only other thing was the hyphen in 90 day, another of to or, and I think I changed if to whether down here in section C. And that was it. Are there any other requested changes of the October 27 minutes? Seeing none, um, I will make the motion to accept, let me get to the right screen here, to accept the minutes of October 13th, 2020 and October 27, 2020 as amended. Is there a second? 
Second. Evan seconds. Thank you, Evan. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll go through roll call. Uh, we start with me. I am a yay. And then we go to Evan. Yes. Steve? Yes. Sarah? Yes. And Shalini? Yes. Those are unanimously adopted. That takes us to our presentation and discussion items, which our first item is zoning priorities. This is where Ben gets to, to I think, share his screen. Um, the goal with these discussions, um, before we have Ben share his screen and welcome Rob, we have Christine Brestra, Planning Director, Rob Mora, um, Building Inspector, and uh, Ben Brager, Planner here with us for these discussions today. Uh, the goal for our committee, I believe, uh, is to come up with priorities that we can then take to the council for, I guess, council action to then be able to inform the planning department of um, priorities outside of their own priorities. Um, and so we're going to be taking a look at the wonderful spreadsheet Ben has created and modified after our conversation next week. And I'm hoping that within the next two meetings, um, our next meeting is December 1st, we might be able to have something that we can take to the council for discussion at potentially the December 7th council meeting um, about potential priorities. Um, so I think that's where we need to be thinking we're going with these discussions at this time. So uh, I, I don't know which of you guys is leading this. Um, is it Ben? <laughs> <laughs> right now in terms of sharing screen and all yeah i'll i'll, I'll get up the uh the matrix on the screen here um and uh chris how would you like to do this i can kind of just run through the uh feedback from last week's meeting and the changes i made Does that sound yeah, why don't you do that and then we can place to start talk about it in general yep. yeah so there was a few um kind of changes to the actual like numbers and you know language within the uh cells here so like um you know I, I had taken notes you know people wanted to see you know small impact changes to large or to medium for some things or you know adding some time to so there, there's little changes i made but uh, only a few but the uh the bigger changes i made were um adding two columns i believe where you know one thing was a clarification on um you know some of the changes that are made are to uh zoning items that are waivable such as like the parking bylaw is something that can the requirements of that can be waived whereas other um things are you know you put that in the bylaw and it's kind of like a permanent change and not something that can be waived so I thought uh, parking bylaw and maybe sign bylaw were the two uh, that fit under that category where, you know, the permit granting authority has the, uh, can waive some of the requirements of that. And then the second column I added was the, uh, some, someone mentioned, you know, it might not be important town-wide but it's something that's inter internally important to the planning department and i think really the uh the two items about recoding the bylaw and reviewing the bylaw were i guess this should say hi as well yeah so these two items were Im important uh to the planning department or had special importance to the planning department um that's not to say everything else we proposed isn't important but um just that these are uniquely important to the planning department. Um, and then secondly, or I guess thirdly, I reformatted the columns. You might notice there's more colors this time. Hopefully that doesn't make it more complicated, but uh, this is now done by topic as opposed to by, um, you know, the body that uh, proposed the item the zoning item so you know previously it was all the planning department items all the planning board items and then all the town council items but i also had this column all the way to the right that talked about whether it was a priority that was shared by another body and so uh the way i organized it now was basically 
grouping those together. So if, if uh, two or three um, different bodies pr propose that zoning item, then I put them together. And you know, the language is slightly different, but they are generally the same kind of concept. Um, you know, so this is uh, zoning, you know, bylaw review and recodification. This is parking bylaws. Um, these three all have to do with housing development, you know, increasing density and unlocking development. Um, this is apartment and mixed use regulations. Um, you know, the planning board had a general item of improving downtown zoning and then town council, three councilors said, you know, doing something around the BG district setbacks. So I kind of grouped those together. And then the remainder are all kind of standalone items that I didn't think fit neatly uh, grouped with another item. Um, and so I think, you know, there's certainly some discussion like, you know, BL district relates to downtown zoning as well. Maybe that could go in there, um, you know, form based code or design guidelines for downtown that could, you know, be grouped there as well. So um, this was just the first first go at it. Um, and I'm certainly open to any feedback, you know, the, my goal for this isn't to just like, you know, fixate on the structure of the table itself, but this is, you know, meant to be a tool for everyone to use to help organize thoughts and, um, you know, priorities. So that's how I see, see this being used. Thank you, Ben. Christine, it looks like you've got your hand up. I did. I wasn't fast enough to raise it in the appropriate way. <laughs> Um, I think we didn't get very far in looking at this chart as a whole mm -hmm. last time. We got through the first portion, which was the planning department um, priorities. And I don't know if we got through planning board priorities and we didn't get into town council priorities. So maybe we should start at the top and review it just, you know, line by line again. Um, what do you think about that? I, I think we could. Um, I'm not sure. I, I guess I would leave it to the committee to see if they need a line by line review or if they have an idea of what each of these is referring to. I, there might be some that we actually do need a review of. Um, but if we're looking at the top here, the blue, the comprehensive review and recodification we talked about last week, um, parking bylaws we would have talked about last week because it's under planning department. Um, I don't know whether we got to housing and increased density at all last week. Um, you know, I think we talked about mix, yeah. mixed buildings um, last week. I'm just looking at the things that have PD next to it. Most of that we talked about. Um, mm -hmm. Flood map, demo delay, inclusionary zoning. Um, we could talk about, you know, I, I think the one thing I would like to talk about is the yellow and the gray, actually, the improving downtown zoning and the need for housing. Um, cause as Ben mentioned, I saw some of the white things that could go into some of those and that related. And I know I have some questions about how they relate and would they be done at the same time type thing. Um, so maybe we start, unless I see any hands from committee, I'm going to suggest we start talking about the yellow section need for housing the way the planning department worded it was need for housing and increased density planning board said unlock housing development and increased diversity with housing stock and the town council summarized it as expand the types of housing permitted in town both by location and permit type um so could could christine could you summarize you know sort of what falls under those categories in terms of zoning changes well um certainly um the upcoming topic that we're going to tackle later in the meeting, um, 40R, would be um, part of uh, need for housing and increased density. And that provides us a way of um, getting more housing units per acre and um, therefore increased density. Um, there are also other things that we would like to do, such as um, redo the zoning if, if whether or not 40R is adopted. I think we should redo the zoning in the BL zoning district, especially the BL zoning district that uh, abuts downtown um, because currently there isn't really a possibility for 
providing housing in, in those um, areas at all, um, that the lot area requirement per dwelling unit is too high. And so um, that really needs to be looked at. And that would provide us with places where we could create denser housing um, in and around the, the downtown area. Um, I think unlocking housing development and increasing diversity of housing stock, um, that was really something that the planning board talked about um, and partially uh, instigated by Maria Chow, who's an architect and she's done a lot of research in different kinds of uh, housing that's um, possible. And she brought to the housing, to the planning zoning subcommittee actually of the planning board, um, kind of a, a study showing how um, different levels of housing in terms of density and also height, density in the terms of things being closer to one another, um, but also in terms of height and number of dwelling units that could be contained in a, in a building um, could get progressively greater as you move towards the center of town, towards the edge of town or in the uh, outlying neighborhoods, those places would possibly remain either one or two family houses. But then as you move closer to the center of town, things can get more dense. Um, she did talk to the uh, zoning subcommittee about um, allowing duplexes uh, in, in the, um, some of the residential zoning districts, like uh, particularly the RN. And I, I believe in the RG, there are two different types of duplexes. There's a, an owner-occupied duplex and there's a non-owner-occupied duplex. And depending on which one it is, there are different um, criteria for um, permit requirements. So kind of trying to make it easier for people to um, own a duplex, uh, certainly in terms of um, an owner living there, it's, um, it's kind of a win-win because the owner can gain income from the other unit to support um, the house as a whole. So that's something that, um, that the planning board and the zoning subcommittee were looking at. And increasing the diversity of housing stock, I think you know the town has gone a long way doing that. And one of the ways they've done it is to allow um, accessory dwelling units, particularly ones that are built out in the yard. It used to be that an accessory dwelling unit really needed to be part of the existing house, but now we're allowing them to be out in the yard. And that's um, something that uh, there's, there's a project that's coming before the Zoning Board of Appeals about that right now. Um, so there are a number of different ways to unlock um, housing development, but those are some of them. And then expand the types of housing permitted in town, both by location and permit. Well, that's kind of what I've just been talking about, the different types of housing that might be located in town. Um, there's also the possibility, and you know, we haven't really talked much about this before at all, but um, triple deckers are really popular in the Boston area. And you really don't see very many triple deckers out here. Um, or three family houses. And again, that's a way for a person to own a house and rent two units, but still live in the house and be able to control what goes on. So that's an example of different types of housing that can be permitted in different places. Right now, we would allow um, three family houses, I believe only in the RG and the BG and the BL, if you can get enough land area. Uh, but they wouldn't be allowed in um, RN or any of the outlying residential districts. Um, they would be allowed in our, um, some of the village centers and the neighborhood uh, residential zone. But um, just you know, thinking more, more expansively about types of housing that might be appropriate in different places. I think our zoning was primarily written back in the 70s when people were very um, afraid of density and they were afraid of UMass expanding and afraid of all the new developments that were being built. Many of our existing apartment complexes were built back in the 70s. And so um, later on in that decade, the town really put the brakes on different kinds of housing that could be allowed in different areas of town. So it's just a, an effort to be more open-minded and, and more expansive about um, possibilities. But at the same time, um, 
maintaining our open space. And I think that's something that we really want to keep in mind because we have, you know, beautiful swaths of open space throughout town. And we don't want, um, we don't want Amherst to be developed the same way some of the near in suburbs around Boston are developed or the same way that Long Island is developed or Northern New Jersey. We want it to remain um, a, a community that has a lot of open space, but we need to think about places where we can put housing where it makes sense, where it's near services and um, transportation. And so, you know, that's kind of what all of these three um, ways of phrasing this uh, one topic mean. And um, I'm sure that others in, in your group, particularly Steve Schreiber has a lot of ideas about this being an architect. Um, so we can talk more about that if you'd like at this time or go on to the next thing. Are there any questions or comments on this particular item on this list, the housing density, housing types, and locations and all, before we move on? Need uh, just open comments or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, actually really interesting, uh, Chris and Ben, but um, you know, housing density is a really tricky one, particularly when you have an established community. And the housing that or the Amherst isn't a red hot housing market. So it's not a place where people tear down housing and try to redevelop. So that's not a phenomenon that's really happened here in, to my knowledge ever. So, um, so, so a lot of the goals are really incremental like the triple deckers, converted dwellings, you know, all the tools that exist now. Uh, the, fastest way to housing density and to increasing new housing is to allow multifamily. So the incremental housing on individual lots is, each lot is a struggle, right? And the yield for that is limited, but the, the yeah, so the best way to increase the housing stock is to, in my opinion, is to look at multifamily, more than three units on on basically on um, brownfields, on sites that are underdeveloped. Excuse me, um, Jack Jemsek would like to attend the meeting and I wonder if um, Athena could send him a link to the meeting. Um, here? Or if someone could send Jack Jemsek a link to the meeting. Let me see what I can do as host. I'm not sure if, I mean, if it should, can, should be on the town calendar, right? Yeah, if he can just join the attendee, does he have the link for the attendee? Because I can send that to him. Can you send that to him? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Steve. While I'm doing that, Evan, you had a comment. Yeah. Um, so the that sort of um, suite of options that Chris just talked about are, are probably my biggest priority. So I guess yeah, uh, there's a broader question here that's more for the committee about what does it look like for us to recommend priorities because all of these are broad enough that Chris just listed a, a whole host of things that could be considered um, increased housing and um, density. Um, but so a, a couple things. Um, one is that you know some of the things she mentioned, I think are um, probably easier to do both um, technically in that it's just, it, they're fairly, they're easier to write the actual bylaw itself. Um, and I think also would be easier in terms of less controversial. So, so for example, you know, I've been talking about uh, duplexes and, and allowing them by right in all residential units. And even folks who um, let's say historically have not been uh, the biggest fan of my positions on density and development have been in favor of um, making it easier to do duplexes. And so even within these broad categories, there's, there's stuff that still seems to me low hanging fruit. And I'm wondering just how we sort of tease those out. The other aspect I think is correcting things. And I, this is, I guess, in part of response to, to Steve's comment, um, which is that there's not a lot of houses being um, torn down and rebuilt, which is, which is true. The other reality is 
half the stuff that I'm interested in, if you did tear it down, you couldn't even rebuild what's there, right? And so, you know, I was looking, when we were looking, when I was doing um, all of my reading for the 40R, I was looking at the um, Kellogg Smith Street neighborhood, which is RG, basic minimum lot area in our regulations, 12,000 square feet. And I think there's only one house in that neighborhood that actually meets the current lot area of our zoning. And so there's an aspect of, yeah, we're not a market where people are tearing things down and rebuilding, but even if we ever became one, they literally couldn't even rebuild what is there now in many of these places in that neighborhood on Shumway, on North Whitney, South Whitney. And so one of the things I'd also like to see us do is, is even if we don't think that this is going to be, there's going to be a lot of um, tearing down and rebuilding, I still think we need zoning regulations that make sense, right? And so part of it is, to me, is also fixing things. And to me, if we have neighborhoods that we like, I, I really like the Kellogg and Smith Street. I think it's a great example of a, it's a neighborhood feel, it's residential, but it is actually fairly dense and it's right on the outskirts of downtown. If we like that, we should have our zoning actually reflect that, um, which we, right now we don't. Thank you for that. Um, Oh, I think I just, we're, we're working together here, Evan, to lower your hand. Christine. <laughs> I just wanted to mention um, a new way that we're kind of looking at the zoning bylaw and existing um, developments. And I think this has been new in the last five years or so that um, there are developments in town that um, were built in the 70s and um, some of the larger apartment complexes, and those are all non-conforming uses in their, for the most part, non-conforming uses in their zoning districts. And previously, we had thought um, we needed to come up with a new type of zoning to deal with those apartment complexes, but it turns out that um, we've had some pretty ingenious developers, and working together with Rob Mara, uh, building commissioner, we've um, realized that since these places are already non-conforming that you can take advantage of a certain section of the zoning bylaw section 9.22 and developers can um, expand their already non-conforming um, developments via a special permit from the zoning board of appeals and this has already happened in the case of um, presidential apartments which added 54 apartment units i think they built either six or nine buildings um, towards the back of the property, part of the property that hadn't been developed previously, but they were really able to add, you know, a substantial amount of units there along with six affordable units because they were required to have a special permit. So since then, um, other owners of large developments like that, um, I think South Point was one of them, have come to us um, with the same idea and South Point it's either South Point or the Boulders, I can't remember which one, but um, is also adding uh, a building. And I think the building has 47 units in it. So, um, so that's an interesting way of developing property in already developed areas, um, adding to the housing stock and you know, adding pretty substantially 54 units in one place and 47 in another. And both required um, the inclusion of affordable units. Thank you for that. I, I'm going to take a chance to comment with some comments similar to Evan. Um, I was struck, I don't know what meeting it was when Steve said the neighborhood he lives in couldn't be built today. Um, and I went, why? Because that's one of the favorite neighborhoods. You know, it's one of the ones that's always pointed to as a great neighborhood. Houses are close together. It's slightly, you know, houses are slightly smaller than what are being built now. Um, it's walkable, it's close to town. And all I kept thinking was why is our RG require such a large lot? Like that the residential general is supposed to be our densest residential. Why is it so large of a lot that's required? Um, and so I, to answer Evan's question, as we come up with these priorities, I think these discussions are what help us figure out what within need for housing um, we would be concentrating on if that's what we say is the next priority, you know, that, that that's what we want our zoning to concentrate on or the next revisions to concentrate on would be 
say the yellow section on this one, housing density, types of location. And part of that I think could include, we could go in and say, you know, expand where things are built, but also correct, you know, find the neighborhoods we like and figure out how to write the zoning that matches that <laughs> in a sense, like um, that type of thing. So that's sort of where I am with priorities of, I think we have larger subjects here. Some of them are very specific, some are not, but we need to figure out through these conversations, which ones are the council's higher priority over some other ones, even if some are somewhat quick maybe, um, and then go from there. Um, I also think we're going, my plan is to split it between those that require consultants and those that not, particularly with the ones that require consultants. Let's rank which ones we'd like to see worked on first. We have a limited pot of money right now. Which one's the higher priority to give some guidance to the, the planning department? So Steve. Yeah, we're not trying to solve the problems now. So back to my own neighborhood. So RG, so one of the issues was that it was a large, it was 100% laid out prior to zoning. And so it was laid out based on some system that who knows what normally, I think somebody owned land, they divided it in quarters and gave it to their, their kids or whatever. So there's a lot of odd lot sizes, but there are lots right near my house that are 195 feet frontage, which is a significant amount. Um, and much larger than needed in RG, but that can't be split because it would, it's not possible to split something that's 195 feet into two lots in RG. You can do a flag lot, but you can't do a um, two frontage lots. So the, I think that those things are worth looking at, in particular when you're close. So there's no provision because of the table three, there's no provision for pretty close unless you have the asterisk, if you have the um, footnote A. So like somebody with 99, like literally 99 feet of frontage, 198 foot lot, they can't split that into two 99 foot lots because they miss by a foot. But an asterisk or footnote A would allow that to happen without going through the variance process, which is a very expensive and likely to fail process. Thank you, Shalini. Yeah, I was just curious how many um, zoning projects can our planning department staff take on at the same time? I mean, I understand different projects involve different amount of work, but just generally, how many projects can you be working on at the same time? Christine, I know your hand was up before that question, but um, so you could say what you were going to say, and then if you could try and answer the question. I wanted to slip in the fact that uh, Jack Jemsick is waiting in the wings and if you wanted to you could turn him into a panelist and that would be great because then mm -hmm. the planning board would know a lot more about what you're saying. So what did you just say Shalini? Uh, I was asking how many uh, zoning changes can the planning department staff handle at the same time? I would say um, one at a time is easy <laughs> but <laughs> Much more than that is is difficult, um, particularly since we have a lot of other things going on. Mm -hmm. But we do have an intention to work our way slowly through the bylaw to um, make a lot of changes and eventually make them all at the same time. So um, it's challenging to work on multiple um, multiple zoning changes um, simultaneously, but um, you know we can we can try see how far we get. I mean, this makes it even more important for us to be really sure about where we want to start because each project takes six to 12 months. And so, yeah, so that was helpful. Thank you. I just want to announce that I have moved the chair of the planning board into the meeting as a panelist. Um, welcome, Jack. We are discussing sort of this wonderful, um, spreadsheet that Ben has created. Um, and we're trying to talk about some of them in terms of potential priorities for the council and, and any recommendations we might have for the council as a whole. We're in the middle of housing right now. Christine? So I wanted to make one more comment, which has to do with the fact that Amherst is a university town. And um, so one of the issues we face 
um, constantly is developers who want to develop housing for students. And um, we had a proposal at one point, I don't know, five or 10 years ago, to make it easier to develop property in the RG zoning district. And at that time, um, there were developers purchasing properties, um, particularly in the RG in the Lincoln Sunset area, but, uh, and I don't know if they did it in the High Street area, but um, what was happening is would they, would, they would buy a property and either build a single family house or buy a single family house, and then they would turn it into a duplex and they would rent it out. So I think that we have to go into this, um, this notion of um, making RG easier to develop and potentially more dense. We have to go into that with our eyes open that there will be um, you know, developers who want to develop the properties, not for people to, not for families to live here and send their kids to school or whatever, but for the purpose of renting them to students. And I'm not saying good, bad, or indifferent about that, but I think that's something that people have to be realistic about. And so, and the other part of that is that when developers build houses, um, and this did happen in the Lincoln Sunset area, they don't consider aesthetics. What they consider is um, how can I get a, ha a house up quickly and rent it out quickly? Mm -hmm. So you end up with houses that are um, from the home store and just sort of plop down on a, on a site. And that's not really the kind of development that we want. So we have to think about, well, how can we create um, design standards or form-based code or something that at least gives us the physical form that we want. I'm not sure that we can do a lot to control who lives there, but in any event, those are just issues that, that come up when you talk about um, densifying the RG. Before I recognize Jack, that brought up a question I have, which is when looking at this list, a lot of the stuff, as you've said before, is interconnected. Um, and so, I, you know, there's things that we have as priorities, but something like design guidelines, which is on this list down there, more than 12 months um, and consultant required, um, is that something that goes hand in hand with some of the things we've been talking about, about unlocking housing with something you just said, is that something that the planning department would think or recommend goes hand in hand with something like that? Whereas, you know, if you're going to, unlock and sort of change an RG density requirement to allow it to be more dense or to add all of those housing types that you'd recommend doing it only after form-based code or design guidelines are in place or is, you know, to be able to control it more or is that sort of ordering not necessarily uh, something you'd recommend? Christine? Yeah. Fun. So I think that if we're if we're focusing on one area, say the RG zoning district, we might be able to tackle design guidelines at the same time that we're um, looking at zoning for that particular district. I think that when we said that form-based code was going to take more than 12 months and require a consultant, we were considering the fact that maybe we're considering all the downtown and all the village centers and you know wherever development might occur. So, um, you know, if we're more focused and only considering the RG, we might be able to come up with some design guidelines that would make it um, possible to densify and expand in the RG and incorporate design guidelines for that particular um, area of town. Thank and, you. Um, yep. Thank you. Jack, you have your hand raised. I, just on the subject of the lot size, I, I do, wanted to go back to that a little bit. And I, I think that the only reason uh, other than, you know, architectural uh, for, you know, limitations on lot size are if you have, you know, a septic or on-site, you know, private well, those things, they, they require space. Um, but other other than that, I don't, I don't know that there would be any reason to restrict, you know, to restrict, you know, the lot size or frontage sort of thing. It kind of, but 
if if we were in an area of, of Amherst that did not have water and sewer, there, you know, you got to start thinking about area because you need you need to be able to have you know adequate distance between the different septic systems and the and the wells and things like that. So I just wanted to bring that up from a, like kind of a, a point, uh, you know, from, from my background anyway, you know, uh, from you know groundwater perspective, <laughs> that's 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 why there's large lots, you know, in, in some rural areas, but I don't see that there's any reason for a lot to be a specific size other than, you know, from an architectural or other you know perspective. So I just I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Um, I, I see two more hands. I'd like to get move our discussion onto the downtown zoning BG BL that sort of footnote A all of that soon. But um, so so Evan and Steve, Evan first, then Steve, and then we're going to move on to the gray and white sections of this chart. Yeah. So um, just just to throw this in there, since we sort of uh, coalesce this discussion around the RG. Um, you know, on top of that, I think there there's probably also a conversation to be had about the boundaries of the RG. Um, and so when we're talking about lot sizes and, and reducing lot sizes, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense for Lincoln and Sunset to have significantly smaller lot sizes. And so maybe there's a conversation about, well, do Lincoln and Sunset really belong in the RN as opposed to the RG? Um, and a sort of on the opposite side of that, if you look at, say, um, a lot of um, Blue Hills and some of Dana, you know, they might actually make more sense in the RG than in the RN because some of those lot sizes uh, meet the requirements of the current RG, but don't meet the requirements of the current RN, even though they're in the RN. And so um, just, I think it's a conversation about lot sizes within the RG, but I think that conversation also needs to include, um, it, are the boundaries of the RG what we think they should be at this point? Thank you, Steve. Yeah, so uh, uh, there are, so part of density is the built environment, but part of density are the actual humans that live there. So there's surprisingly a number of, of humans that live in the RG, at least my part of the RG, despite the fact that there's large lot sizes. And that's in part because of some of the Amherst zoning or pre-zoning that has allowed conversion of big houses to multifamily and or allowed accessory apartments. So despite the fact that it looks like it's not dense, it actually is dense in terms of people that live here. So that calculation also needs to come in to, you know, as we go through this, that calculation also needs to be considered. So the other thing is that um, many humans that live in Amherst have cars and dealing with the cars is the vexing problem. And it is one of the drivers of lot size because cars are normally have to be accommodated off street. We can, we can certainly question that. But in particular, we don't want, Amherst has been good about, as, you know, especially in the downtown areas, not allowing cars to be parked in front of single family houses or duplexes or whatever. So there, I, I don't know if it's where it is in the zoning, but typically they have to be parked to the side or behind. And so the one way to get to really narrow lot sizes is to allow parking in front, but that completely changes the aesthetic. So some of this we have to be very cognitive of. We have not grown up as a community with alleys. Alleys solve a lot because then parking and service can all be handled from the back, but we don't have any alleys in Amherst. So that also creates a complexity here. Thank you. I'd like to move on to the gray and parts of the white. Last week we talked about demolition delay flood maps. I think we skipped inclusionary zoning, I'm not sure, and sign. Um, but I guess one of the questions I have, you know, I think we understand what improves downtown zoning and BG district setbacks and all mean. Uh, this goes to what Ben was mentioning earlier. I look at the gray and I ask, does footnote A do BL district requirements? Um, belong into that gray section, um, especially the BL district requirements, because that's a, a sort of, in my mind, an essential part of the downtown zoning is the BL thing. Um, and so, you know, when the planning board, and maybe this is good that Jack's here, when the planning board talks about, quote, improved downtown zoning, is it talking about BL, BG, 
the setbacks that we have here, is it a footnote A thing? Um, you know, is it form-based code? You know, what what is it, um, Christine or Jack? I'd say it's all of those things, um, particularly the BL. And I think that could be um, potentially moved up to be uh, closer to um, some of these other things, improved downtown zoning and um, the housing business, because that's really what it's all about is trying to get more housing into the BL zoning district. And you know, many people want to view the BL as a transition zone from downtown to um, the RG and the outlying areas, but it isn't really, I mean, physically it is a transition zone, but in terms of its zoning, the text of the zoning bylaw, it isn't a transition zone. It's more like a highway strip zone. Um, so that really needs to be addressed if we want to be able to densify housing in the, in the downtown area. What was the other thing you mentioned? Um, uh, not A. Footnote A really applies all over town. Um, it's a mechanism by which uh, someone who wants to develop a property can ask to have a certain dimensional requirement waived. And if you look at the dimensional table, you'll see um, footnote A either in a, in a whole category of things like front yard setbacks. I'm just pulling things out of the air. I don't know if it really does apply to front yard setbacks. I think it does. But anyway, um, or it could apply to a specific thing like height in the BG district. So um, it's something that allows developers to, um, if they can't quite get it right within the box that they're allowed to build, they can ask for um, you know, a dispensation to be allowed to build something closer to a property line or taller. And in the case of, we just had a, a case of this recently, which didn't have anything to do with housing. It was the Amherst Media building, which asked for a footnote A modification um, for its front yard setback in order to be able to fit their building in the area that was designated um, as appropriate by the local historic district commission. So footnote A applies to all different kinds of things. It's not specific to housing. Thank you. Jack, do you have anything to add about the planning board's um, priority for improving downtown zoning? Well, we're, we're going to discuss uh, the 40R proposal, which is again, a, a downtown focus uh, tomorrow night. Um, but I mean, for, for me, um, you know, the, the, the BL uh, zone really bothers me <laughs> uh, for the same reason that, you know, Steve Schreiber wouldn't be able to build his house, you know, in kind, <laughs> but anyway, it, it just, it's, it's so broken. And, and I'm just, I'm just wondering um, if 40R um, is going to help uh, in, in, in a somewhat of an expedited manner um, for, for the downtown, because I'm really concerned about the timeline of our, of the, of the zoning bylaw changes and, and what we're, we're faced, you know, as a, as a town uh, with COVID and things like that. And, and for me, um, that 40R is an overlay and it, it just seems like it, it kind of smooths out the, the huge problem we have the, with the BL because uh, most of the 40R you know, uh, has that, you know, uh, BL overlay as long as well as some other the general business as well, but um, okay. yeah, I think, you know, and I really appreciate some of Evan's comments um, from the last town council meeting with regard to, you know, um, comments with regard to that are against densification or building height and, and things like that, because it, it just, that that structural racism, I think, was the term. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Evan. Um, but <clears throat> I think those are things that we need to. And then, and then affordability. I think you create these buildings, and and uh, and and then if nobody can afford the rents, you know, that's that's a problem. So we really, uh, I mean, I know like Amherst Copy just moved out. 
you know, they're in Hadley now, you know, it's kind of, I, I know the owner there pretty well. Um, but we have, you know, a lot, a lot to, to think about with regard to how to make, you know, make things work. And, uh, but I'd be very interested in the CRC's perspective in terms of the a realistic timeline for zoning changes. Um, because I just feel like it's a tough, it's a, it's a, going to be a tough road. And I, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are if a 40R overlay would expedite um, at least that zoning uh, aspect versus the entire redo. Yep. So we'll be talking about that in the next hour, starting around three o'clock. Um, okay. We are specifically. Um, I think now it's time we, we've sort of talked in brief about most of the stuff on here. I know we haven't covered it all. Um, but I, I want to pivot to the ones that are marked consultant. And I think there are four of them on this chart. We saw three of them there. Um, parking is up there. And then the other three are sign by law, design guidelines, and climate action goals into the permitting standards and other zoning requirements. And so I, you know, we have a pot of money already, um, you know, budgeted for some sort of planning consultant. Um, I don't know whether it's specific to downtown um, or specific to a, you know, a part of the planning, but I think it's probably general enough to maybe cover at least three or four of these. And so I'm, I'd like to hear from the committee of those four, which one would be their highest priority. And I'd also like to hear from the planning department, um, you know, in terms of the consultant money, which one would be the planning department's highest priority um, for the use of the money that's already been sort of budgeted for planning consultants. Evan. Um, so I'm, I'm going to actually start with the one that it, to me is not the priority, and then I'll give a reason why, which is incorporating climate action goals into permitting standards and zoning requirements. And that's not because I don't view that as a um, priority, but because I think there are other ways um, we could do that. When I uh, when we were at, uh, a bunch of us were at uh, MMA in January, I attended um, a session on all the ways communities have used those MVP action grants. Um, and one community, I think it was Cambridge, uh, used the MVP action grant to hire a consultant to essentially revise their zoning to build climate action and climate resilience into their zoning. And so to me, that's a that's something that we could um, speak with uh, Stephanie Chicarello and ECAC about whether or not they would be interested in applying for an MVP grant to do that. Um, and so then not depleting the money that you're talking about right now. Because um, I think I just think there's other ways that we could we could pay for that. Um, to me, my, my biggest priority would probably be the form based code um, for other village centers. Uh, any other committee members at this time before I recognize Christine? Steve. I second what Evan said. Uh, Shalini. Yes, third. And just because I think that would solve so many different, it's like one thing, but that's has such a huge impact on so many things, including downtown vitality and what Jack um, just pointed out in terms of COVID, in terms of um, all the other issues that are related to downtown. So I think form-based zoning would really help with a lot of that. And Sarah. So we all agree because that it's definitely would be my number one. And and I do agree that, you know, we're we're working on density and like Shalini said, at the same time, you know, if we're bringing all these people here, we don't want to be playing catch up with a community like Hadley. We don't need to be them or offer the same services, but we also want to be able to start um, creating areas um, of interest for all the people that we're bringing here. And I think that's a, a good way to do it. And it gives, it gives the community a lot more um, flexibility in a positive way. Thank you for that. Um, Christine. 
So I wanted to um, just let you know that the money that we have right now um, was um, appropriated a number of years ago. It was right after the Gateway project um, was looked at. And the Gateway, if you remember, was an area along North Pleasant Street stretching from roughly Kendrick Park up to the university. Um, so that money was earmarked for um, zoning in the downtown and the gateway area. So I think, you know, we would be able to use that for um, form-based code in, in the downtown and probably we could stretch it to the BL um, and gateway, but that's, that's really what we'd have, the area that we'd have to focus on. So if there are other things within that area, um, we could also use it for that, but it's only $40,000. So it's not a huge amount of money. Um, I did ask for another 60,000 as part of the next capital round, um, but I, I don't know when that's going to be considered and whether that would even be uh, positively looked at with all the other capital projects that are coming along. So um, anyway, right now, $40,000 for the downtown and the gateway. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask a few questions of myself. I, I will say that that it sounds unanimous from this committee without taking a vote that form based is the highest of the ones that have been identified as needing consultants. Because um, that would be mine too. Um, so my question is, I have a couple of questions. Design guidelines. Um, this one is for downtown and village centers. If we concentrate, you know, if we had the consultant and it was for downtown and it was for the gateway area, could those um, design guidelines be transferred or reused and all in the village centers? Or do you need completely different design guidelines for each village center? So that's one question. And then my second question actually then relates down to the town council design review board where four counselors talked about design review board and they were incomplete. Um, some wanted to keep it, some wanted to get rid of it. So my question would be design guidelines. I'm not exactly sure what parts of town the design review board must review things for, um, but would adoption of design guidelines into our downtown village centers or even other areas of town um, essentially get rid of the need for a design review board? Um, would it sort of duplicate what the design review board does. So those are my questions as it relates to that consultant. You're, you're looking for an answer from me now? If you've, if you've got some thoughts on that. <laughs> so I think the design review board, unlike some people, I think the design review board is useful. Um, one of the things they do is they look at, you know, minute changes to buildings, particularly signs. Um, but they also look at, you know, other things that are are not so minute um, and they really scrutinize them pretty carefully. And um, I think that their, their uh, jurisdiction goes beyond design guidelines. Unless you have design guidelines that are like as strict as Nantucket, you're really not gonna get to the kind of detail that the design review board looks at. So when I'm thinking of design guidelines, I'm thinking about the kinds of things that are contained within the 40R um, zoning proposal where you're talking about, you know, how is the ground floor treated with regard to windows and um, entryways and things like that. And then how are the upper floors treated and are they uh, recessed or are they um, flush with the ground floor? And then how, if you have a top floor, if it's a fifth story or sixth story, how is that treated? Those kinds of things are design guidelines, but you're not gonna really get down to, you know, well, if you have a sign for a restaurant that's on the first floor, what's that gonna look like and who's gonna review it? So I feel like there is a, a, a role for the design review board. Um, and I think that they would still be needed even if we had design guidelines. Do you have an idea of whether if we adopted design guidelines for downtown, they're transferable to other village centers, or do you really need different design guidelines for different areas due to what those areas look like? I think the ideas of them, the concepts of them could be transferable. Um, I think you'd have to scale it down because obviously, you know, design guidelines for a four or five story building are going to be different from what you might want for a, a village center. Um, but, you know, um, so the other thing is that we do have some ideas about um, 
looking at the village centers and doing plans for the village centers. We haven't really gotten that project off the ground, but each village center is pretty different in the way it was developed. And so um, probably the design guidelines for village centers would go along with the planning effort for each village center. That would be my recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Um, Evan, Stephen, and Shalini, and then I think we're going to conclude today and move on to 40R. Evan. Yeah, I guess, so I guess my question was given that we have, we keep referencing the design guidelines in the 40R proposal, and given that we have those um, written, not adopted, but written, um, I guess I'm curious, does that um, make it easier or at least lower the, can we use those as a foundation for de design guide? I mean, we're talking about design guidelines for downtown and we have a 40R by 40R bylaw that has design guidelines that encompass an area that is a significant portion of downtown. I mean, how much more is it to, to be able to get that, to that next step? In other words, could you use the 40R um, proposal to create your design guidelines and zoning for downtown. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it certainly gets you on the path. I'm not sure, I haven't thought about this, so, but I'm, I'm not sure that it would get you the whole way, but it would, it would certainly get you part way down the path. Okay, uh, any follow up, Evan? No. Yep, that was my question. Okay, Steve. I'll pass. I'd like to talk about 40 hours, I'll pass. Um, Shalini? Oh, I, just a quick question. Is the gateway project something that could be revived or can we never ever talk about that again? <laughs> um, it became a little sort of a third rail um, after the project was done. There was a lot of opposition to um, the idea of developing North Pleasant Street in the way that was described in the Gateway Project. Um, and a lot of that opposition came from the neighborhoods that are you know, closest to UMass and really feel the most vulnerable. Um, certainly, you know, the ideas that were in the Gateway Project, I think they're worth revisiting at some point, um, but we have to expect that we will get a lot of pushback from um, the neighborhoods that are closest by. Thank you for that. I, I just wanted to comment, Ben, I think I know you have to leave soon. You you can unshare your screen and, and do that when you need to. I think we're good. Thank you, Ben. All right. Thank you all. For today. Yeah. Can uh, I just say the new table was amazing. It really was super. Thank you. Awesome. Good to hear. I like um, Dave. I just wanted to quickly um, respond to Chalonet's question about the gateway. Um, my, my take is that nothing should be off the table. We should be talking about everything. And what happened five or seven years ago um, is water over the dam. And I, I think Chris is correct. There was a lot of uh, neighborhood opposition, but it's a new day. We have a council, we have a new form of government. Uh, we have a pandemic, and um, we shouldn't be afraid to look at anything that makes our community better, stronger, more resilient, um, provides housing, provides jobs. So um, I, I think it should, everything should be on the table. Thank you. Um, I want to note for Lindsay, in case she didn't catch it, that Sarah had to leave at three o'clock. Um, so she is no longer with us. She has not lost connection. She had warned me ahead of time that she had to leave the meeting at three. Um, so we are down to four committee members. Um, I think we had a good discussion. We've got an idea of where the CRC's priorities for spending money is. Um, we would take a formal vote on that as we get closer to formal recommendations. The next meeting, I'm sort of going to next agenda. The next meeting will focus on potential ways to prioritize the rest of the list that would be done in-house. Um, that'll be the focus of this portion of the discussion for hopefully being able to bring something to count, council by the 7th. Um, uh, moving on, our next agenda item is 40R. Again, this was one that Steve had asked that we put on the agenda 
last week and there was clearly a lot of desire to discuss specifics. So it is back on the agenda this week. I have not asked for a presentation on the specifics. I told our planning department that many CRC members had already attended many of the forums, um, could watch the videos and we didn't need specific new presentation. We could watch the consultant's presentation and start right in on questions um, and, and things like that, um, unless there were specific questions about what it is and all, but I was, I was giving us the benefit of the doubt that we've done our homework. Um, I, I think I did ask Christine, but Jack is here. Um, I don't know how much he can add, um, but I asked Christine to be ready for um, sort of summarizing where the planning board's thoughts are on 40 yard before we get into all the questions we have. Um, so I know, I think the planning board's got a more in-depth discussion planned for tomorrow night, but if Christine or Jack could summarize where they are now and sort of those discussions as it is before we move into questions and all from the committee. Christine? So I think the planning board has a mixed um, feeling about 40R. I think um, it was presented to them in a very um, preliminary way in May, and they had a lot of questions and um, concerns about it. And then it was presented to them again. Um, I think they had a discussion sometime in August and then another presentation um, more recently. And at the more recent presentation, I think there was a better feeling about the 40R. I think that um, the planning board members saw that the consultants had made changes to respond to concerns of, um, of residents in the area, as well as concerns that were expressed by uh, planning board members um, and, and as the public as a whole. So I think the planning board had a better feeling about 40R. I think that there are still a few members who um, just feel like it's not, it's not the right thing for downtown, um, but they haven't you know, arrived at a, a conclusion as a group about it. Um, but I think that Mr. Jemsik is fairly enthusiastic about it. So you may want to hear from him. <laughs> Jack? <laughs> I, I would have to say, I, I can't believe, I, I feel like I, we, I was talking to Chris, you know, when we met with the, the consultants or they presented in, in uh, March, was it? Or February, pre-COVID. Yeah. Um, and then Chris said, well, we're going to have another presentation. They, it's, their, it's on their contract. And it's like, why are we doing this sort of thing? And, but I, I, I was just really struck by it. It was like night and day. Um, they really tightened things up. They, they really took in comment. Uh, responded to comment, uh, and it was impressive. And I'm, <laughs> uh, you know, so I, uh, I think uh, Maria Chow uh, is also, uh, I think, uh, uh, has a similar opinion. Like we should listen to this. And, and again, I, I respect Rob Crowner so much, and he's on the Housing Authority. Uh, and he's been a proponent of it. I wanted to hear him out and, you know, and, it, and so it's, it's solid. It may not be for the extent that they, they have proposed, but it may be, you know, perfect for a portion of the area that they have proposed. But I, I don't, we have three new board, uh, planning board members. I have no idea, you know, where the planning board is uh, on this, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of eager to talk about it again. Um, and I just, I just, I kind of feel have uh, a sense of urgency um, now versus back, you know, pre-COVID uh, for the for the downtown. Thank you, Jack. So we're going to move to uh, committee questions, comments, thoughts. I'll, I'm not going to try and segment between any of that. So, you know, you conclude it all when you talk, uh, Steve. Yeah, so um, I think that the town hired a Cracker Jack team to put together this proposal. And I do think that they listened to particularly the, uh, the neighbors, right? The ones that will be affected, particularly by those ones that live adjacent to the BL zone. 
So I, I think that, and also I've chatted offline with, um, you know, people like Ra, but I, I think that there's a lot to the proposal and I really hope that, uh, that we move forward with it in some version. But I guess a couple of thoughts that I sent after the last presentation is one is, to me, it seems like this will only work if it's accompanied by downzoning in the, um, the um, the BN zone. Mm -hmm. So in other words, because right now there's no there's no particular advantage to someone to use 40R because they can already do five story buildings, you know, et cetera. But it seems like um, if we down zone the more by right zoning and then had 40R as a way of relieving from those zoning restrictions that would make this a lot more likely to achieve the goals that we're, we're hoping for. So the other area is the BL zone. So again, there's no advantage for the 40R proposal. And I know going up to four stories in BL is controversial. So I understand that resistance, but I think we're, and, and I understand that it's gonna loosen up housing, but I guess my concern that what it will do is only encourage non-mixed use buildings in BL. In some of the sites for like the site on Triangle Street across from Kendrick Place, just seems like the most obvious place for a mixed use commercial on the ground level, residential above. But I'm not sure that the 40R proposal as read will unlock that particular property. Totally understand the concerns of the Cottage Street neighbors who live right behind there. But it seems to me that the proposal could be written in such a way that there is, there's a certain height if you're facing, say, Triangle Street or a major artery, but then there's another height. You have to step down to another height if for that part of the building that, say, the rear of the building that faces a lower scale residential area. Thank you. Um, anyone else from the committee? Evan? Well, I didn't, Chris, Chris just put her hand up. I don't know if she wanted to respond to Steve. Christine? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that this is a framework on which we can build our version of a 40R. So there's a lot of opportunity to change um, the dimensional requirements or allowances. And I think Steve's right that, um, you know, having a lower building closer to the residential neighborhoods and a taller building up along the roads makes perfect sense. And I think Maria tried to address that in her um, her map that she sent around today. I don't know if you all received it, but um, you know, it was a way for her to understand what's being proposed, but then it's also a way to understand how we might want to change it. So we don't have to take this 40R proposal from the consultants lock, stock and barrel we can take it and change it to our own specifications and really make it what we want it to be. Thank you, Evan. Um, so I have a couple things. I'll just try and run through them at once and hopefully not take too much time. Um, I think overall conceptually 40R is a really good thing for our community. I, I mean, I think that it has um, a little bit of everything that that we want in the community and on the council. Um, I think in when I read through the bylaw, and, you know, for our last meeting, I had sort of just skimmed it, but I, I fully read it for this one. Um, and I saw a lot of things that I, that I like in there that I think um, we're not even elevating as as reasons we should do this, including things like, um, you know, putting th parking in the back and minimizing curb cuts is something that's so important to walkability and the feeling of a community you wanna walk in. You know, my least favorite part to walk downtown is over by, um, you know, where the pub was and, and the spoke because it's just, you're walking along parking lots and it's curb cut, curb cut, curb cut. And so I think that's, you know, we're, we're always pitching this as just affordability, density, and design guidelines, but I think there's a lot of other really important things that we need to make sure we're, we're telling people about. The other thing that we haven't talked too much about but when I was reading through in the design guidelines was talking about things like um, mandating street trees and low impact design um, to deal with stormwater, encouraging reuse of stormwater for irrigation. And I think when it comes to um, the climate action plan that ECAC is putting together and the climate focus we've had, those are things that fit right in. Um, we, we're focusing a lot on reducing emissions, but 
um, anyone who had ever attended an ECAC meeting, which is, I think no one in this group um, knows that I'm always talking about the biggest thing we need to do is stormwater, stormwater, stormwater when it comes to climate change. And I think that there's a lot of things that talk about how to deal with stormwater um, uh, using um, green infrastructure instead of gray infrastructure in here. And so I think that it, you know, it's also in uh, a climate adaptation and a climate resilience proposal um, as much as it's some of these other proposals. And I think we're not always elevating those things. And I wanted to make sure we did that. Um, some questions slash concerns um, though, you know, one is my concern from the beginning has been that we would view this as a way to fix the BL, um, which is sort of something that Jack touched on earlier. Um, and I still think, and I'm glad that Chris spoke to this earlier, um, I really don't want this to be the way that we fix the BL. I don't want us to say, we don't have to fix the underlying zoning in the BL because now we have the 40R. I think we need to do both. Um, and so I, I'm hoping um, that we don't see this as the solution to the BL is, oh, well, we'll just do the 40R. And then developers have the choice, develop under the 40R or don't develop, right? Um, because they literally can't in the BL. And I, I don't think that's what we want to do. Um, you know, I also, I understand Steve's point of, um, it becomes uh, more um, uh, desirable for the 40R if we down zone, um, but I'd really like to see this be a proposal that says, here's how we are incentivizing over our underlying zoning without us having to make our underlying zoning less development friendly. Like, I really want this to be something that says to developers, we're giving you something in return for you giving us design guidelines and affordable housing. And I don't want it to be a situation where to do that, we have to take things away in the underlying zoning. Um, I think there are ways that it has um, upzoned in, in a few areas, um, which I think is good. Uh, you know, I don't wanna to get too specific about some of the parcels, but there's a few areas where it seems like it's actually going to be um, that the overlay will actually decrease density versus the underlying zoning. Um, there's a, a couple parcels around um, the one behind Wrens, I think it is, and some along Kellogg that are currently in the BG, but would it be in the second subdistrict? So I think that actually you get less density than under underlying zoning. And may, I might be incorrect here because this is not my area of expertise. Um, but I guess I would be curious about um, that. And then my, my one question, I have a whole bunch of things, but I'm trying not to hit everything. My, my one question is, you know, I was looking at dimensional guidelines and they specify some of the dimensional guidelines for the districts. Um, but of course, there's a whole bunch of dimension, dimensional regulations that aren't mentioned in the bylaw. And so is the assumption that um, the overlay district changes the dimensional regulations that are mentioned in the bylaw and those that are not mentioned are the same as in table three, the dimensional regulations. Because if so, I know, you know, I had a meeting with an architect almost a year ago, and they said one of the biggest issues that they faced in doing the BL um, was um, the maximum building coverage and maximum lot coverage, which doesn't seem like this touches. And so if it defaults to um, the maximum building and maximum lot coverage under the underlying zoning, I guess I'm questioning whether this is uh, helping uh, actually fix some of the BL problems. So I know that was a lot and I, I do have more, but I'm trying not to take up all the airspace, but I am sort of curious about that idea of, um, of does it default to underlying zoning where dimensional regulations aren't specified in the uh, 40R? Christine, do you happen to know the answer to that? Oh, you're muted. It does default to underlying zoning. So if there are things that we want to change about the underlying zoning, you know, we can do that via the changes that we're working on as part of the overall zoning amendment. So um, we don't have to live with the dimensions that we have in the BL. I agree with Evan that we really need to look at the BL and change the BL, even if we decide to um, adopt 40R. I think that's going to be important because there will be some developers who just don't want to get into um, the requirements of the 40R. They're just not big enough. I've heard from some people that um, only big developers will really be attracted to working under the 40R um, because of so many different kinds of requirements. So we want to be able to allow our, our local developers to also um, develop in, in the BL. And I think it's important to change those um, zoning requirements to allow that to happen. Thank you. Um, 
I, I'm going to take my turn. I'm also going to suggest that everyone, if you have comments and all, um, send them to, I, it, it could be me or directly to Christine. I was thinking if you send them to me, I can grab them all and ship one document off to Christine and the planning board instead of she getting four or five. I think that would be easier to work with. Because I also took a deep dive into this for really the first time. And I was struck by a number of things, some of which were, Evan mentioned, um, you know, some of the why some sections of BG were designated as subdistrict two instead of subdistrict one, um, you know, some of that stuff. Um, but one of the things that really struck me was the, I, I finally started looking at, you know, height requirements, setback requirements and all of that. And there are parts of the RG district that are labeled subdistrict two in this or planned to be subdistrict two. They're near McClellan behind North Pleasant. Some of them are on Kellogg from what I could tell from all the maps. And what struck me is something we were talking about earlier, which is everyone refers to BL as a step down district between BG and RG. But RG, RG allowances are 40 foot heights and three floors um, in RG, which is actually higher than BL height, require, height limits of 35 feet and three floors. And so I was struck by that you know, and that's the underlying zoning because that allows an RG to be taller than a BL, yet everyone's afraid of a four-story BL, but RG right now can be taller than BL. Um, and so when you look at that underlying zoning, then I, I question the, the height limits on the subdistrict two, you know, they, the height limits I must say on subdistrict two went kind of crazy in that they were different depending on where you were in subdistrict two. And so it was really hard to figure stuff out. But, but what I was looking at is the, the parts where RG is the underlying zoning, what I could tell is the height limits would be 25 feet and two and a half floors in, um, in the, that subdistrict two with the overlay, yet the underlying zoning is 40 and three floors. So it's the height is not giving you your benefit under the under this 40R, I guess what would be giving, and I'm not sure much else is giving you the benefit because when you look at what's allowed, RG already allows two families, already you know allows one families, um, it allows multifamilies, um, you know, through a special permit. So maybe you get a little bit that um, it doesn't allow mixed use. But I, I wondered. One of my biggest question was goes back to what does the 40R give you? And I think for subdistrict two, in BL, it might give you a little more because it actually allows you. And BG, it, it even if it's subdistrict two, it allows you to build more than just a mixed use building there. Um, for BL, you could build two families. We don't really have a three family designation from what I could tell in the zoning bylaw, um, but it allows you to build more residential. But in the RG, it doesn't allow you to build more residential and in fact restricts you to lower heights. Um, and so that concerned me. And, um, and I, I wanted to mention the climate action too, because I noticed things exactly what Evan said. And so I, I would encourage more thinking on that part on things that could be, you know, right now, some of the landscaping design guidelines are um, encouraging of, you know, bioswales, encouraging rain gardens, encouraging native species. Um, and I would, I, I, I would suggest whether we ask whether we could, instead of encourage, require um, under these, um, the bioswales, the rain gardens, and some of this stuff for, you know, stormwater management and all of that to, to start incorporating all of those climate action issues into that. Um, yeah, and then the other one, specifically Kellogg, um, Kellogg, the parts that were designated um, were designated as subdistrict two, yet across the street from them are five-story apartment buildings. And so I was I, I wasn't quite understanding why they were designated subdistrict two instead of subdistrict one, because you know, some of them are already BG. Um, but across the street is, you know, 
apartment buildings, which seems to more match a subdistrict one than a subdistrict two. Those are briefly some of my thinking on this. Um, and I'll, I don't know whether it helps or not. And I've got a long list as I was trying to figure it out. Uh, Christine. So I wanted to say that um, the RG zoning district is very restrictive in the terms of um, how many dwelling units you can get on a particular lot size. You need 12,000 square feet for the first unit and then you need an additional 2,500 um, square feet for each additional dwelling unit. So um, the, the overlay district, the 40R overlay district wouldn't have that, um, that restriction. So you could pretty much fit um, as many dwelling units as you could fit in the box, whatever box you're allowed to build, you can fit as many dwelling units in there as you, as you can possibly fit. So that really makes a difference in the number of units that you can get on a, on a particular size property in the RG. So it's, it's kind of, um, it's, maybe it's a little bit invisible that this is the case, but the density that's allowed by the overlay district, the 40R is much greater than the density that's allowed in, in the RG zoning district. So does that help? Yes, that does. Um, even though the box has to actually be smaller potentially. But I think that one of the things that the, develop, that the consultants were looking at was what exists um, in the RG. And the fact is that there aren't really any, uh, not, I'm not gonna say this as a blanket statement, but take North Prospect Street. There probably aren't 40 foot tall buildings there now. And we didn't want to um, create a situation where we were building things that were much bigger than what is right there now whether or not it would be allowed in the future with regard to zoning. And maybe we need to change the RG to be, be less tall. I don't know, I haven't really looked at that, but um, the point is that we didn't want to overwhelm the neighborhood that is there with new buildings that would be a lot bigger than the, the buildings that are there. Evan. Yeah, so I think Christine just answered a question. Part, part of part of this is you know a little bit of confusion um, so the minimum lot area and and the additional lot area per family is is that eliminated if you under the overlay district mm -hmm. okay w earlier when I asked about if it doesn't specify the dimensional regulations does it does it default to underlying zoning? That was one of the ones that I noticed wasn't specified, but you're saying it, 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 that one actually does, those two dimensional do not default to underlying, they actually are eliminated. That is my understanding. I can confirm that, but um, I think- That, that makes a big point. difference in my understanding of this. That's my understanding. Shalini. Okay, one of the concerns I heard, and I think Chris, you briefly mentioned it is how, um, because of all the paperwork, it's really hard for developers, small or local developers to make use of this. So is there a service we can provide to developers or do we know how, how successful this has been? Because I was also reading another study, it was about Boston, but it was an MIT paper on 40R and they said it wasn't very successful because the community didn't like it because of the density the developers didn't like it because of the complications in the paperwork and so it didn't really get utilized. So my question is, it's, if we are gonna go through all of the work to make it happen, then is this something that is gonna be utilized by developers? Christine. So we've talked about um, creating a um, department or a person or some kind of, um, administrative mm -hmm. service within mm -hmm. the town government to help people who are facing either a requirement for affordability or a desire to provide affordability. Mm -hmm. And right now, when a developer has to provide affordability for his um, development, say Barry Roberts on University Drive had to provide four um, affordable units. Well, he has to find um, an entity or an agency that will help him to um, make the tenant selection and then monitor over the years that the tenants who live in those affordable units are in fact eligible to live there. And there's a bunch of paperwork that goes along with that. 
um, he absorbed the cost of that, um, as did the people who are um, developing Aspen Heights, or it's not really Heights, but it's <laughs> the development on Northampton Road, which used to be the Amherst Motel. Um, so they're absorbing all of those costs. If a smaller developer wanted to develop something in the 40R, and he wasn't going to get you know 36 units out of it, um, then to provide the required number of affordable housing, he would have to hire you know Amherst Housing Authority or hire Valley CDC or hire somebody to help him um, make the, do the lottery and then help him to monitor things over time. And that is an expense. So we have thrown around here in our department of oh, the idea, maybe we should have somebody in the planning department who can help um, developers do that. And especially if we're ever going to require um, inclusionary zoning across the board. Mm -hmm. um, that could be a service that the town could provide, but that conversation hasn't really gotten much traction. So I think it is true that we could provide this, but it would cost the town some money to hire somebody or some bodies to do this, and, and we would have to kind of be intentional about it. So does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Can I just ask another question? Sure, Shalini. Yeah. Um, another question I'd heard was that in other, and I haven't done enough study to see whether 40 R in other communities was in the heart of downtown. Does it make a difference whether it is in the heart of downtown or not? Um, the only other community that I'm really familiar with is Northampton, and they have 140 R that's not in downtown, it's on mm -hmm. Hospital Hill. And then they have another 40R that is in downtown on Pleasant Street. So they've kind of gotten, they've done it both ways. I think there has been increased um, density in both projects, but it's two, two different kinds of things. And I haven't really studied either one of them very closely. Okay, so there's nothing to say that there is a disadvantage to having a 40R in downtown. I don't think so. The only disadvantage here is um, what Steve was mentioning, which is the fact that developers can already fit as many dwelling units as they are able to within a certain mm. box. Um, so the box is only limited by how high it can be and what the setbacks are in the lot coverage and building coverage. Um, and so they're not really getting the density advantage by choosing to develop under a 40R in the BG zoning district nor is the town getting an advantage of the differential between the number of units that could be built via underlying zoning and the number of units that could be built under a 40R. Um, if you can show that there's a, a delta there, then you can get money from the state to pay you for that delta. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that in the BG, we have it in the BL, but so that's an issue. And that's why Rob Crowner and Steve that's one of the reasons that you would want to downzone the BG before um, adopting mm. 40R, because then you could show that, oh yes, you get a whole extra floor if you um, use 40R and therefore the developer would be attracted to that. And the state would be able to say, oh yeah, these units wouldn't have been allowed under underlying zoning, so we can pay you for those, those um, additional units. Mm. So we would down zone first and then claim the incentive yeah. or whatever from the state. Interesting. Hmm. I haven't talked to anybody at the state about what they would think about that, but <laughs> <laughs> that's something that um, the consultants thought might be a good idea. So, and they're interesting. Uh, knowledgeable hmm. about this. Wouldn't I have a follow up question on that? Wouldn't doing something like that almost force developers to use 40R instead of truly giving them a choice, at least in the BG area, if we down zoned all of the BG down to BL? Um, yes, is that something wise to do? I don't know if it's wise, but it would force them to provide affordable housing in the BG. <laughs> Or just disincentivized to do any kind of development if it's easier in other neighboring towns. Hmm. 
Are there any other thoughts from the committee members um, at this time on 40R? I, I will say um, I encourage the committee members to send their thoughts if they want to, to me so that I can compile them and send them on to Christine who can then share them with whoever is appropriate to share them with um, or just create our own file um, if the planning board can desires to continue forward with this. Um, you know, it sounds like, you know, for Jack's benefit here that CRC doesn't have a strong opinion one way or another right now, now has more of a lot of questions based on what we've seen and all um, and all. Um, and so um, at this point, uh, uh, before we move on, I'll, I'll recognize Jack one more time. Jack. Yeah, I, I just, I just want to say, um, appreciate the input and you know uh, I don't know how the conversation is going to go tomorrow with the planning board but um, you know I think the down zoning would would be it's a, it's a difficult thing you know but we're we're you know you guys are looking at the entire bylaws now so so anything is possible but um, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I think the, the understanding was the downtown, you know, wasn't the spot for the 40R. Um, but I think, but again, the, the recent proposal has, you know, piqued my interest. It's worth a discussion. Um, but I would be interested in terms of, you know, the BL and the timeline, you know, what do you anticipate that we would actually do something about, you know, the existing zoning. I mean, is it, are we five years out, you know, three, two, you know, and uh, for me, that's, if it's, if it's going to be a long time, because I, it's always a difficult issue, you know, in Amherst to, to make changes. So I was just, I was wondering what, you know, people's gut feeling on the CRC would be with regard to, and Rob, uh, with regard to the actual bylaw revision. I think we'll have a better idea on December 1st when we bring that discussion back. Um, from today's discussion, it sounds like BL and housing are some of the more important ones for CRC. So they may come up towards the top of um, beyond the recodification and all as that's going on the, the focus of the next sort of bigger changes to stuff, but we'll have a better idea after the next meeting, I believe. Um, so thank you. At this time, we're going to move on on our agenda. And then we do not have any action items today. We're in a lot of discussion mode right now. Um, the item after action items is general public comment. We do have members of the audience. At this time, we will accept general public comment um, for those who wish to comment on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC for up to three minutes in order to do so if you have um, joined through Zoom, not through a phone number, then all you have to do is raise your hand. There's a button somewhere on the bottom and I will recognize you. And, and if you joined, I'm not sure we have anyone that has joined by phone. We do not. So I don't have to go through the phone raising hand instructions. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to make any public comment, uh, it can be on what we discussed today and it can be on anything within our jurisdiction that hasn't been discussed today. Uh, please raise your hand and I will work my way through recognizing everyone. So we're going to recognize Pam Rooney first. Um, I think you should be able to unmute now. Hi there, Pam Hello. Rooney. 42 Cottage Street. Uh, thank you for talking about this topic. I think uh, you all had a really good conversation about it. Um, I also appreciated the seeing the priorities uh, that you were discussing in terms of zoning. And having Mr. Jemsik in this conversation is probably a good thing. There clearly are lots of overlaps in the topics. Um, what has been going through my my head is, you know, we're talking lots of little details about setbacks. And we're talking about lots of little details about height. And really, it feels to me that from a, from a, from a 
planner's perspective, what are all the cards on the table here? Um, I don't know that I've ever seen from anyone, whether it's the zoning subcommittee or the planning department, um, a, a nice comparison of what are the, the pros and cons of A, inclusionary zoning, B, uh, fixing the downtown, B, C, fixing um, the limited business district, um, you know, D, 40R, uh, E, form-based zoning. So there are lots and lots of tools that we have, as well as, you know, the, the underlying um, the underlying zoning that just feels like it wants to, you know, get our arms around and get down on a, on a piece of paper where we can actually see some of the comparisons between one form of zoning and another and what are the benefits to us as a town? Where do we have the most control? Um, I was um, reminded of some of the issues, for instance, in the RG, um, zoning where I think a couple of years ago, a developer wanted to buy a couple of parcels on, or actually wanted to zone a couple of parcels on Butterfield Terrace to, to RG so that they could take the houses down and build multifamily housing. So it's, it, it really is a very, it's a very intricate and very uh, interconnected conversation here. So, um, I'm just wondering if it would be possible for a group, and I'd ha be happy to volunteer, to just get some of this all in one place. So rather than saying, yeah, we really love 40R, but there are lots of issues with it, or yeah, we really want form-based, how do we craft this? I, I would love to see some comparisons. You're struggling, you're all struggling to get into the details of it, so are we to just see where we can get what we want. We want some affordable housing, but we sure don't want to kill neighborhoods in the process. So it's, it's sort of, and we don't, don't want to kill the downtown in the process. Um, so is that possible? Thank you. That was a long question. Thank you for your comment, Pam. Um, I'm sure you'll be getting some answers or if you attend more meetings, you'll be hearing similar questions and, and responses to, to something like that as we move forward on the discussions. Um, is there anyone else that, that would like to make public comment? I am seeing none. That brings us on our agenda to, whoops, what happened there? Um, to announcements, are there any announcements from anyone? No announcements. Uh, next agenda preview um, will, at this point, I think we'll go back to zoning and then try and squeak in a little bit of housing policy and not put 40R in. Um, or I think we'll wait, await uh, planning board's conversation on 40R before we discuss it again. Um, so not next meeting, but maybe we'll consider putting it on an agenda a couple meetings from now if, if we hear from planning board that it's something we should be doing. Um, any requested items for the agenda from anyone? Not seeing any. Um, so, oh, Christine. Uh, this is, has to do with the housing policy. Um, can you send me whatever the latest version of the housing policy is? I'm not sure um, where to find it. I will send you a copy. It is an extremely rough draft with a long list of unorganized um, and not even called potential items in it. So I, I will warn you now, but also in your email that it is not, you know, while it is a public document because it has been, you know, posted for meetings and we've talked about it, it is not something that has, it's it's very much a work in progress, I would say, um, and, and very much on the early end of work in progress over 
even mid end of work in progress. Um, but but I will I will send you the 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 last one that was in in a public doc, uh, uh, in a public meeting that was presented in a public meeting for you. And um, any, any other um, items related to agenda setting or anything? Um, seeing none, I don't have any unanticipated business. Does anyone else have anything that business that was not on the agenda? Uh, seeing none of that, then I will let you guys out 15 minutes early. <laughs> so we are going to, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. It is now 345 and CRC is adjourned for the day. Thank you.